Use the Create New Design from File tool and select the Lift Point Meshing file. And once it's open, save it to your current project. The Finite Element Analysis method uses a mesh, a series of elements, to represent solid bodies in order to understand how stresses, strains, and deformations will occur over those bodies. The ability to control the mesh and understand the consequences of modifying the mesh are important to getting quality results with minimal effort and minimal time. Fusion 360 incorporates several different methods for managing and manipulating the mesh. Let's explore a few of them. Once a study has been created, a mesh folder will be added to the browser. By right-clicking on this folder or selecting the edit icon, you can generate the mesh or set the basic settings. Selecting the mesh icon if a mesh has not been computed yet will prompt you for permission to generate the mesh. For now, I'll say no. You can also control the mesh settings from the Manage pull-down on the toolbar in the simulation workspace. Going to Settings, which has a shortcut key of E, will take you first to the General Settings, where you can change the simulation type for the study and allow you to modify the name of the study, but you can also go to the Mesh Settings. By default, Fusion 360 uses a model-based size to determine the element size for a mesh. You can use the slide bar to modify this. You can also use tools such as absolute size. And if you have a multi-component design, you can choose to scale the mesh per part. So if you have a mixture of very large and very small components, it will work to use the appropriate mesh for that size component. Under the advanced settings, we can change the fashion that the elements will be applied, you can limit how the mesh will transition across curves and apply more detailed control to the mesh. For now, let's just accept the defaults, go to the mesh icon in the browser, and generate the mesh. After a few seconds, a dialog will flash showing the number of elements and information regarding the mesh, and then the mesh will be displayed on the model. Let's make a simple modification to the current mesh and see what the visual result is. I'll move the slide bar to the center of the model base size and update the mesh. When the mesh is updated, we'll see roughly double the number of elements on the large faces. This will give the analysis a more precise representation of the component, but that's not always necessary. In fact, it can be taken too far. Going back to the mesh settings and making a modification, pulling it all the way down to 1% of the model base size, we'll even get a warning that less than 3% leads to high memory consumption. In fact, I did an analysis based on this mesh that took over 10 times as long to compute and yielded only a 1% difference in the maximum stress result. Let's switch to another approach using an absolute size. I'll put in a value of 8 and update the mesh. You'll see that it looks very much like the initial mesh result. If there are key areas that are critical to the design, it's also possible to apply local mesh control. Local mesh control allows you to select edges and faces and apply specific mesh values or mesh sizes to those faces so that if you have a very large body with small features that are critical, you can make sure that those small features get the proper attention in regards to the mesh size. These holes are critical to the design, so I'll select the edges and use a finer mesh value, setting the desired element length to one millimeter. The model will update, and you'll see how the mesh not only works around the edges that I selected, but blends into the other mesh elements surrounding it. Now let's run an analysis with our current mesh and see the results. The safety factor is good at over 9. 
and we can see the maximum stress value of 29.4. Where the stress is located is an area where there are sharp edges on the model. This peak stress area is also away from the critical faces, so we might want to do some additional refinement to further analyze whether or not we need to make a change to the design. One of the options that we have is adaptive mesh refinement. By default, adaptive mesh refinement is bypassed in Fusion 360, as you can see in the dialog, where it shows that the current value is none. If we set it to low, the adaptive mesh refinement will allow itself to do two mesh refinements with a convergence tolerance of 20%. The results of the analysis have to vary more than 20% to continue doing refinement, and the portion of the elements allowed to be refined is only 10% of the body. We can also change what the baseline is for this accuracy. Looking at medium and high, we can see how the number of mesh refinements will increase, and the amount of convergence is allowed to be much smaller to trigger one of those refinements. And it will allow a much larger portion of the mesh to be refined. Custom will allow us to set any of these values to the ones we want. As an experiment, I'll set this adaptive mesh refinement to high. This is a relatively simple model, so I don't expect the adaptive mesh refinement to do too much work. After starting the simulation, I'll expand it and see that it does a solve. Now it's refining the mesh. and then it's refining the mesh again. So it's found some areas that need some additional attention. And we can see that not only has the peak stress increased, but it's relocated from the edge of the upright portions to a front face. Switching to the mesh view, we can see how the mesh has been refined around those sharp edges and at the ends of the fillets down near the corners. This has allowed Fusion 360 to see that the peak stress is in a different location than was initially indicated. Any of these meshing techniques can be used to suit your needs, and you will discover that with experience, it will be easier to discern when the mesh needs to be modified in order to make sure that you're getting the proper result.